Okay, here we are at the end, the last panel, but near and dear to many of our hearts, that's the K-12 education panel. And I'm very pleased to introduce the moderator of the last panel, um, Dr. Myra Gunn, who many of you know from her voice, probably from her person too, but also mainly her voice. She's the host of the radio programs Tech Nation and also I think Biotech Nation on KQED, which is a weekly program focusing on the impact of technology, science, media, and the internet. And Dr. Gunn uh, is a mechanical engineer by training and worked at many of the most innovative um, organizations like NASA, um, Rolls-Royce, that was a kind of an interesting one, uh, in, the, uh, in the nation and in the world. And I think, as I understand it, that's part of her interest in K-12 education because if, if you can't maintain innovative organizations like that without uh, smart kids coming out. So uh, we, I recently heard her moderate a panel at the Commonwealth Club, who's one of our uh, co-sponsors here, and she did a remarkable job. And the most important thing, though, is that she promised to uplift us in this final session and keep us, uh, give us some energy, because it's the end of the afternoon, and, and we've heard a lot of gloom and doom for the last three panels. So now, anyway, she's at least going to keep us going. So thank you, Dr. Young. Well, I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and I do also have an interest in education. I'm a professor over in the, the business school at uh, the University of San Francisco, which is a Jesuit institution. And of course, the Jesuits have ethics in every course, even ethics is ethics. So if you say ethics, I'll show up. You know, that's the way it is. And I'm uh, the managing director of the uh, new biotechnology programs we have in the business school, which uh, combine, for the first time, uh, not just science and information technology and business and legal and, and ethics and uh, uh, everything else under the sun and social responsibility. And you can't talk about one without the other. And so all of this is really interesting to me um, in, in terms of you've got to get there through education. And we're really impressed about that. First thing I would like to say is I'm really delighted that the last session went over because I was going to protest vehemently that we were the longest session at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Who was doing that? I'd like to know. But now we, you know, in the end, we'll be all right. The other next guarantee I have for you is that we will end at 445 and that 446 you will have a glass of wine. So that's another guarantee. And, uh, uh, and so just to tell you, it's a little bit like everybody else's. We're not having any slides. People are speaking individually. Uh, then we'll have a little confab among ourselves in front of you and uh, questions to the audience. But at the very end, we're going to ask each of our panelists to give their final word so we have a final perspective from each of them. And that's what we're looking at. Um, first of all, I'd like to start out for his initial thoughts with Norton Grubb. He's a professor of, in the School of Education here at UC Berkeley. Um, his interests include the effects of resources in schools, certainly uh, uh, important right now. And his teaching includes the economics of education. So there's no doubt we are we're looking forward to what he has to say. So Professor Grubb. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am indeed Norton Grubb. Uh, I'm part of the School of Education, but I'm also part, uh, I'm also the faculty coordinator for something called the Principal Leadership Institute, which is a program, we think it's an innovative program, uh, to prepare urban principals for the Bay Area. And some of what I'm going to say uh, is going to come from that. Can I get rid of this? Is this okay? Yeah. Is that all right? Lay it down. Uh, we're going to have a low-tech presentation, and you're going to use your listening skills to divine what I have to say. So someone, I believe it was someone in the room, congratulated me as be, uh, with being part of K-12 education because K-12 education has supposedly been level-funded in Governor Brown's new budget. 
Um, uh, that's not my understanding at all. Uh, the budget has uh, a two million billion dollar deferral uh, of Prop 98 money, so that money is going to get deferred from 2011-12 to 2012-13, and who the hell knows what's going to happen with it after that. Um, education is not like building roads. You can't wait a year and then just restart it, because the kids are going to come in August. So that looks like a cut to me, and we're going to do away with another another billion dollars or so of cost of living adjustments. So it looks to me like we have a $3 billion cut in K-12 education, even though everybody has said, oh, education, K-12 education is not being cut. Uh, so you know, I, I think that we're in for cuts all around, and we could duel a little bit about who gets the bigger cuts. But I don't really think it's worth doing that. I think that um, uh, the, the cuts are severe. Uh, in, in any event. But the real story about K-12 education is not particularly this year's cuts. It's 30 years of cuts. Um, starting with Prop 98, uh, Prop 13 uh, back in 1978, uh, where we slowly dr uh, drifted from uh, fourth or fifth in the country in spending per capita down to um, something like 46th per capita. And over that period of time, if you take a look at our NAEP scores, the scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, they also drifted from down from the top uh, four or five states to the bottom two or three states. So as John Marrow put it in a little um, in a little um, PBS program that was entitled First to Worst, uh, California has really uh, nosedived in, in the, both the support for and the quality of its education system. So the issue is, as many of the speakers of this conference have uh, said, a long run problem that we need to get out of. Um, it's really been uh, a problem in K-12 education of 30 years in the making, and it may take us 30 years to get out of it. So I'm going to focus on three issues that I think are necessary for the long uh, run. One is enhancing revenues. Uh, second is distributing that revenue in different ways. And the third is making sure that that revenue is spent effectively. Uh, revenue enhancement. Well, we haven't heard very much about tax issues, so I'm going to wade in and uh, make the bold statement that what we really need to do is to have a firm um, tax base in this state. Uh, and, um, and until we do, K-12 education will always be at risk because, of course, it is now the highest, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, single highest uh, source of, um, of funding in California, about 43%. Um, uh, so how can we do that? Well, the first thing we have to do is to moderate or eliminate Prop 13. Um, it, that would have to be done slowly and carefully over five or ten years so that people don't have a steep bump in their, uh, in their tax bills. That wouldn't be great. And similarly, or, or uh, in addition, um, there are these devices called circuit breakers. Uh, which prevent uh, property taxes from getting too high for the elderly or for low-income people. They're very simple to conceptualize. They're not hard to put into place. Uh, so we could do a job uh, of restoring or, or restoring the property tax, getting cutting back on Prop 13, and that would give schools the funding base that they need at the local level uh, to actually uh, determine their own futures. Um, I was um, pretty amused when uh, Warren Buffett the sage of Omaha came into the state to advise the Republicans on what to do about taxes. And the first thing he said was, well, obviously, you have to get rid of Prop 13. And he was promptly ridden out of the uh, state on a rail uh, or <laughs> the next uh, plane, whatever it might be, um, because he, had, of course, had touched the third rail of California politics. But until we start talking about that, I don't uh, see that we're going to get out from under the uh, uh, revenue problems we've been in for such a long period of time. Then we need to look at increasing other taxes, not, as Governor Brown has it, by uh, either maintaining or increasing rates, but by broadening bases. Uh, broadening the, the base for the sales tax and broadening the base for the personal income tax. That does a couple things. One, it makes the taxes um, uh, fairer. Uh, it makes them less regressive. And second, it makes them more efficient uh, or non-distorting, um, not to have higher tax rates. And I think it also makes the tax structure less volatile. Uh, one of the problems in the state is that we've had a very volatile tax structure, which goes way up in boom times and way down in, in um, <laughs> in recessions, and that's not good for uh, rational planning. Uh, so if we could broaden the base of some of these taxes, that would be great. And then the third point I want to make um, is to reverse the decline in corporate taxes. 
Um, I don't, if we think of our tax structure as an ability to pay structure, which we sometimes like to do, the corporations in the state benefit from uh, public education. They've been among the uh, first to uh, insist that they need a well-educated workforce, uh, and they ought to be paying their fair share. For reasons I'm not clear about, they're not doing that. So we have, we have several different ways to go in terms of uh, restoring a tax base. Now, you know, some of you remember fondly Alexander Haig, uh, who was Secretary of Defense, uh, and uh, his, his comment at one point, I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. Well, um, I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. I do realize <laughs> that the political acceptability of these revenue raising measures is, uh, is really quite low. Uh, however, um, you know, you can't both claim that you want a better education system, a better schooling system, and say you don't want to raise taxes or restore a revenue base. You've got to take your pick. So I think we need to start talking about sensible ways in uh, which we can restore the tax structure, the tax base for education in the country. A, a second thing I want to talk about, but just briefly, because this is the kind of stuff that puts people to sleep, is uh, revising the state's financing formulas. Everybody agrees that the finance formulas in K-12 education are impossible to understand. Uh, they're incredibly confusing. They are an overlay of little changes and little improvements and deprovements over the years. Um, and so uh, we really need to do something about the uh, uh, complexity of the state's um, school finance formulas. Now, there have been two big uh, commissions doing a lot of research on this in the past decade. One was the Master Plan Commission of 2001 to 3, which some people in the room sat on, including me, and which came out with what I thought was a splendid school finance structure. Uh, unfortunately, that <laughs> reported at the end of uh, 2003, and I believe uh, the disastrous uh, election uh, in which we had 220 candidates occurred in March just after the report. So the report was dead on arrival, as they say. And then there was another set of, of, of um, uh, research uh, called Getting Down to Facts, coordinated by Stanford University. And then several summaries of that, as if summaries would somehow uh, say something new and different. So this is an area where, unlike most areas that academics like to talk about, no more research is needed. We've done plenty of research. Uh, we need to get to uh, some actions. Um, so um, three or four different actions we need to think about. One is uh, the state has a tremendous number of categorical grants. Uh, grants for very specific kinds of uh, spending. And that this hampers the ability of districts and schools to spend money as they will in ways that are consistent with their perceptions of their needs uh, and their students. Uh, we started in 2009 to uh, reduce the number of categorical funds, but there's a long way to go. And almost everybody agrees, I think, that um, categorical, ca categoricals need to be cut. A second uh, issue is that local districts need to be given their own revenue base. One of the terrible things that happened in the wake of Prop 13 was that districts lost a revenue base that they had to actually think about. How much money should we spend of the citizens' money? What should we spend it for? How can we spend it wisely? As the fraction of revenue declined, power went to Sacramento, uh, following, of course, the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. Now, you know, if, uh, let me see, uh, the sponsorship of this, uh, of this conference is not responsible for the next statement. If you were in a state with a terrific uh, education um, uh, establishment in the state capital, that would be a great thing to do. But between term limits for legislatures and problems in the California Department of Education due in part, as far as I can figure out, to civil service requirements, we don't have a lot of people in Sacramento who have a lot of knowledge or a lot of history or a lot of understanding about what really happens in schools. So sending power to Sacramento has not been a great thing. Uh, and we need to uh, sort of claw it back to the local level, uh, to the district and, and school level, as far as I can figure out, where um, where, uh, where um, uh, decisions can be made much closer to the locus of, of uh, students. 
Um, in the Master Plan Commission, we first considered uh, a supplement to the state income as, as a way of restoring uh, a local tax base. Uh, that didn't really work very well, so we re recommended greater use of parcel taxes. There's no great resolution, although I'm going to point out one more time that if we lifted the Prop 13 limits, that would restore a base for local districts to have. A third kind of issue is that state funding uh, needs always to be equalized for differences in tax bases among jurisdictions. But there's another idea that's cropped up um, that has a lot of promise, uh, and that is to use weighted students as a way of handing out money, where the weights are greater than one for certain kinds of students who you think have uh, greater needs. Low-income students, limited in, uh, uh, English language learners, special ed students, but you can toss in other kinds of things. You know, you may want to ha have another weight for gifted students or for uh, uh, high school students relative to elementary school students. You can weight things as you will. Uh, but, um, but the point is that, again, in achieving equity in many different ways can be done by revising uh, some of these formulas. And then my own favorite, <laughs> which is not really popular, is having adjustments for the cost of education differences across districts because, of course, the cost differences, uh, uh, particularly for, for persons personnel are very, very different in urban districts than they are in, in rural districts. So there's all kinds of ways, there's all kinds of policies on the table that people have been articulating uh, for quite a while about improving the state's funding formula. Uh, and um, I think it's uh, time to take a consensus and, and run with it. The third thing I wanted to talk about is making money matter. Uh, most educators and most reformers in, in, in California and everywhere else believe in something I call the money myth. Oh, this is the point where I get to sell my book. The money myth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't come to talk, I came to sell books. Um, and what the, the money myth really runs back to the early years of the uh, 20th century. Um, uh, Elwood Coverley, who is you know, known to some of us who love the history of school finance, uh, said the question of sufficient revenue lies back of every other educational problem, and he said that in 1905. But the fact of the matter is that neither in the US nor in the UK is there a very good relationship between spending money and student outcomes, um, for reasons I can go into in more detail than you probably want to hear about. But it's basically that money is necessary for some resources in schools, but a lot of, those, uh, a lot of that money gets wasted or spent on resources that actually have negative effects. So if money goes for positive, neutral, and negative uh, effects on outcomes, you have something like a zero average. Um, and so uh, we need, money may be necessary, but we need to worry about uh, uh, what's sufficient to, uh, make it, uh, uh, to, to make it effective. One of the things I want to point out is that uh, we ought to shift from focusing on dollars, uh, revenues and expenditures, to focusing on resources of different sorts, teachers that can educate kids, leaders who have some sort of vision and uh, uh, will for instructional improvement. Um, something like a school's climate is a resource that you can show uh, makes a great deal of difference both to uh, kids' test scores and to their progress uh, through the high school. Stability is a resource, and it's fiendishly difficult to get uh, stability of students, of teachers, of superintendents, of principals in urban districts in particular. So we need to worry not about money but about resources. Some of those resources need to be bought. Uh, for example, higher salaries for teachers because that gives a district a bigger pool of teachers from which to choose and it reduces turnover among teachers and teachers who are stably in a district uh, turn out again in the wonderful uh, statistical methods in the money myth, buy one today, uh, turn, uh, stable teachers really do enhance uh, learning. But there's other kinds of resources. Um, one good example are compound resources. And a good example is the failure of class size reduction in the state of California. We reduced class sizes, but we forgot to provide adequate facilities, so kids were taking classes in broom closets. We forgot to keep the level of teachers uh, up, uh, because a lot of districts ended up buying um, uh, emergency credential teachers, and most of all, we for forgot to give teachers training so that they would teach in small classes in different ways. If you teach the same way in a small class, 
class. You're not going to have anything different go on than if you have a large class. Uh, and then we have other kinds of resources that I call complex and abstract, like stability, uh, like um, pedagogical uh, a facility of teachers, like the leadership of principals and assistant principals and the like. So there's lots of different ways in which we can think differently about resources in school and their connections to money because some resources cannot be bought. Uh, some can be bought, but some cannot be bought, but have to be constructed by leaders and teachers and school communities working together. So what might help schools and districts make money matter? I'm just going to riff uh, a, a series of possible uh, policies. One is returning decision making to the school level. Uh, where, uh, where school people can see what the issues are and, and what the problems are. Uh, some districts in the state have instituted school site budgeting, and uh, that's been a good way to do that. A second is to improve the ability of school leaders and teacher leaders to think about resources. When you look at most principals programs, they don't actually include very much about resources, or when they do, they treat it as an accounting problem, you know, what the budget numbers are. Uh, and they need to know, think, be able to think about resources in much more flexible ways. A third way would be to institute something I call waste audits. Am I over time? OK. Uh, <laughs> waste audits in which you examine how you're spending money and what of that is getting wasted. This turns out to be a very simple, straightforward exercise that, uh, that identifies lots of waste. A fourth would be to engage in resource audits, not fiscal audits, resource audits, to see if a number of uh, effective resources are in place. Uh, another one would be to develop sources of information at the state level about what's effective. Because if you go down the path that I'm outlining, teachers and teacher leaders and, and leaders in schools need to be aware of what's effective and what's not. And now they don't have any such thing available to them. Uh, and finally, a different approach to uh, reforming schools. We spend a lot of time engaged in pro what I call programitis. Investing in little programs like after school programs, a better math curriculum, uh, a little Saturday class, um, you know, little discrete programs that we think are going to be, uh, be particularly effective. These are almost never absorbed into the core of the school. What sh we should be thinking of instead of little programs, little self sufficient programs, is enhancing the capacity of the personnel in schools, whether they're teachers or principals or counselors or any other kind of personnel. And that would really create the ability to have schools that are, in fact, uh, effective and using money well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I've just, I think I just figured out why Warren Buffett is worth so much money. He comes from a town where a really great house costs $150,000. So <laughs> he's got a lot left over. So I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I would challenge everybody to, not just go to the same old sources of revenue that we've seen before. Uh, I know that I was described recently a school district where they left the computers on all night and they were using that with a local university to do grid computing on their science and they ended up with a with a six figure income just by leaving their computers on all night. And when we look at some cr creative revenue generation, I'll be a lot more happy as an engineer than um, then I will, uh, or I could move to Omaha, Nebraska, which is a great place to live. So uh, at any rate, we're, so we'll look at some, some uh, really new things here. Now our next speaker is Gary Hart. He's a former state senator, 20 years as a state legislator, so he knows his way around Sacramento. Also a former California Secretary for Education. While a legislator, uh, he authored major legislation, numerous, uh, which included in education, including school finance. So he's got a very long-term view here. So uh, Senator Hart. Thank you, and uh, thank all of you for hanging in. Uh, when I noticed that we were going to be the, the last panel on an all-day Friday session, I figured the audience would be declined by, the attrition rate would be more than 50 percent. So you guys have hung in well, and uh, um, I'm going to do my best to, to be concise and uh, not uh, overdo my time. Uh, I just wanted to first uh, build on a couple of points that uh, Norton made reference to. Um, one, in terms of K-12 education and its funding, and, and he highlighted that, but let me just put it um, a little bit differently. California today ranks $2,500 less per child than the national, than the national average of educational e expending. It, it's really 
quite substantial, that translates into you know, about seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars per, per classroom. So uh, even though there's less uh, harm to the K-12 Brown budget, uh, don't think that K-12 education isn't hurting. And no one's made reference yet to uh, you know, a couple of factors that really make education particularly challenging here in California. One is that a quarter of our students are English learners, uh, much more than twice the national average, and these are children that require uh, special resources, special attention. Um, also, and Stan actually made reference to this in his uh, presentation on healthcare, we have um, a higher impoverished population than do other states, and, and poor children um, require more resources as well. So in addition to not having as many resources as other states, we have these, we have these special challenges. Um, we have something called Proposition 98. References have been made to it somewhat longingly by some of our friends in higher education that K-12 education has protection, but higher education does not. It's not much in the way of protection if you look over the last 20 years, and I think there's a growing sense among people in Sacramento who are proponents of K-12 education that uh, Proposition 98 uh, has not been a good bargain for um, elementary and secondary education in California, largely because the initiative is very much closely linked, particularly in some of the follow-up measures to the passage of Proposition 98. It's linked to the state of the economy. And when we have recession, uh, K-12 education uh, suffers along with everyone else. And unlike other states that have a strong, stable property tax base, we really lose ground in these recessionary, um, in these recessionary times. Um, I wanted to also touch on the revenue side because uh, Norton made reference to it and he's correct that there wasn't too much else that's said about it. Uh, just a couple of points to sort of, if not disagree, but maybe flesh out a little bit some of his ideas. Um, first is the parcel tax. Uh, we have a mechanism now by which uh, communities can increase their funding for K-12 education by a two-thirds vote for a uh, parcel tax as opposed to an ad valorem tax. Um, there are significant proposals uh, that have been around for some time to reduce that two-thirds vote to a 55 percent or to a simple majority vote. A recent uh, PPIC poll indicates that there's public support for that, more than 50, I think it's about 53 percent, supports a reduction in that uh, parcel tax. Um, and I think that's something that really ought to be at the top of our agenda uh, in Sacramento in terms of, um, of revenue enhancement. There are problems with parcel taxes. Uh, organizations like the CTA feel that if you have a parcel tax, there'll be less pressure to support public education maybe at the state level. There are Serrano implications with parcel taxes if they really take off. But it seems to me in terms of better alignment than Norton was making reference to and trying to get more money into the system, a parcel tax um, makes a lot of sense, uh, that, that reduced vote. Another area, and Norton also made reference to this, was revisions in Proposition 13. I'm not as bold as he is, if I heard him correctly, of basically changing the residential um, portions of uh, Proposition 13. I, I don't think that's, uh, even with circuit breakers, it's going to go anywhere. Um, but I do think um, the split role, which has been talked about a lot, um, is something that deserves, um, deserves attention. Um, again, the public policy uh, poll indicates that if you ask people in California, are you willing to have increased taxes for, um, for education, for K-12 education, uh, people say yes, uh, but the tax that they, the only tax that they're willing to support is the business tax, not the sales tax, not the income tax, but a business tax. It's not fleshed out any more than that. You could increase the state corporation taxes uh, by 50 percent, it wouldn't generate that much money. But if you were to reimpose um, a property tax, a higher property tax for uh, commercial properties in California, that could be a significant uh, revenue enhancement for, for education. And I think that that's something that's uh, you know, politically doable. One other area that I wanted to make reference to, particularly in response to what was said earlier today from our corrections folks, um, that we, there's really not much that we can do on the correction side, and I, I guess I take some exception to that. And what always sort of sticks in my craw is that the average salary for a prison guard 
who basically is doing custodial work. It's, it's important. It's not work that I would want to do, but it's basically babysitting custodial work um, for someone who engages in that kind of work. They have to have a high school diploma. They engage in two or three months, as I understand it, of training to be a, a, a prison guard. And after five years of service, the average pay with furloughs and what is in place today is in excess of $70,000 in California. Take a classroom teacher in California with five years of service and five years of college education, their average pay is less than $50,000 a year. I think that those kinds of comparisons uh, we need to be talking more about when we're talking about uh, prison costs. It's not something that we're going to be able to address tomorrow, but in terms of long-term um, changes in structural benefits, in terms of what our priorities are, it seems to me a direction we ought to, we ought to be taking a look at. Reference was also made, an important reference to sentencing here in California, um, and someone said that a sentencing commission, if I heard them, or changing our sentencing laws is a non-starter. My understanding is there was a bill a year or two ago in the legislature that passed in the Senate uh, calling for the creation of a sentencing commission that was, again, passed by the Senate but was defeated um, in the assembly. And it was defeated largely not because of the prison guards but because of the DAs and the, the police chiefs. And I really think that we need to um, start linking some of these areas to uh, education and we need to have the education and business community who understand that some changes in these sentencing policies are appropriate for us to, to be able to move on this front and I don't think it's impossible. It's not going to be easy but it's not impossible. Um, lastly, uh, Professor Raphael, Raphael made reference to, just sort of again stuck with me, that someone who is, if I understood him correctly, in a level four high security prison who's a geriatric prisoner who has to get out of his cell is accompanied by, by two guards. Um, and I think of what we do in terms of class size in California. I mean, it's basically, you know, what, what, a, what a, a, a professional client uh, ratio is. We have no problem with increasing class size in California, but these uh, work rules as it relates to geriatric pr prisoners, we can't touch. So I think there are some areas um, as it relates to redirection of costs, particularly in corrections, that uh, we ought to be taking a look at. Um, let me just say a word about what's happened in recent years with K-12 budgets in terms of expenditure reductions because they have been significant. Uh, one are our, our, our pay uh, salary uh, reductions for, uh, for, for teachers and other employees, um, but it has also been instructional days. Um, uh, we've had a significant reduction in many school districts of instructional days of, um, of, of usually a week from 180 to 175 days. And we've had class size uh, increases, uh, particularly K-3, uh, eroding uh, the reduction in class size that existed here in, in California going back to the Wilson years. Um, we have not yet got to the point of what we did back in Proposition 13 is to reduce uh, you know, course offerings, particularly in, um, you know, in secondary schools, um, vocational education or, or CTE classes or arts and music, but if something doesn't happen, uh, those are probably likely to be next on the chopping block. We've also set, seen significant reductions in adult education. These are courses in basic literacy and education for um, adults, um, and we have um, also seen re reductions in, in bus transportation. Uh, one of the other points that I, you know, I wanted to make is, as we talk about trying to improve academic performance among um, our students, and what does research tell us that, you know, that actually works? There are three or four things that I think there's some consensus do make, make a difference. One is time on task, the amount of time that students have exposure to instructional uh, time. This is particularly important for low-income students. So these reductions, not only in the school year, but also in summer school, where the um, effects may be even greater for uh, low-income students um, is, um, it, it, it's quite substantial. We also know that early childhood education is a very important, uh, has a very important correlation with later academic performance it's a, if it's sustained over a period of time. Fortunately, we have not had cuts in our uh, preschool budgets here in California, although Governor Brown's budget uh, provides um, you know, some cuts in those areas. They aren't devastating cuts, but they are p cuts of, um, of, uh, of some concern. We know that teacher quality is uh, important, and we know 
that high expectations where you have clear goals and you're working towards measuring how students are, are uh, working to achieve those goals, those are other things that um, are, are important. Um, what I worry about is if the situation doesn't change and we don't have really a significant jump on our economy or some revenue enhancements, um, we're going to be staying the course probably with some of these cuts in terms of teacher salaries and uh, reduction in student exposure to instructional time that are going to have a significant impact, I think, on low-income in students. There are some other things that um, we'll probably be hearing more about in terms of uh, budget reductions. They're sort of high visibility items but they don't necessarily generate a lot in terms of cost savings. Um, those things include some test consolidation. We do a lot of testing here in California, uh, too much testing um, and some consolidation, and it's something that uh, I know Mike Kirst, who's the new president of the State Board of Education and Governor Brown are supportive of. Um, I think that's probably a good idea, but it's not gonna save us uh, um, a, a, a lot of money. There's some talk about district consolidation. You know, we've got, uh, you know, a thousand school districts here in California, um, and there could be some significant consolidation similar to what happened uh, back in the 1960s, but again, that's probably not gonna save us uh, um, a whole lot of money. And as Norton made reference to, we may have some more block grants. Uh, it gives sc local school districts more opportunity to engage in strategic uh, funding, but uh, it's not a, a huge cost savings. Um, an area that I have always felt and want to just make brief reference to that I think is ripe for attention if we want to try to reorganize and try to bring about some cost savings in our education system. We have this curious system that exists in American uh, public education of what is called step and column where teachers get uh, not only a cost of living increase when times are good, but they also get um, increased salary based upon number of years of service and they get increased salary based upon the number of college credits that they, they take. Um, this was instituted back in the 1930s when a lot of most uh, teachers did not have co uh, college degrees and so this was an incentive system that was set up. It makes absolutely no sense today in terms of improving the quality of uh, teaching performance to say if you take uh, more college classes uh, on your own, a complete laissez-faire system, <laughs> Uh, that that's going to have any kind of measurable effect upon student performance. And we are investing more than a billion dollars a year in these kinds of enhancements for salaries of, for a system that just doesn't make any sense at all. What we need to be moving towards is some kind of a career ladder where there is more careful evaluation of teachers. We have it in higher education with associate professors and full professors. Someone was saying last night that here at Berkeley, there are like 12 different steps of full professors. We have nothing like that in K-12 education. We don't have what I know exists in the CSU system where we have salary differentials for engineering professors and uh, math professors. Um, we have tremendous shortages in special education and, and, and math and uh, English learner teachers, and yet we have no salary you know, differential. Uh, so this is something that I think is long overdue and I think there's some potential savings. Let me just close by mentioning, in addition to a couple of the points that uh, Norton made reference to that were on my list, uh, a new um, student weighted formula for school finance, uh, some other areas just very briefly uh, that I think are rap ripe for attention. One is um, trying to, to target monies uh, more effectively. And the trade-off here, if we don't have more money, is I would say some expansion in class size for some of our other classes because we have no indication that there's a correlation between class size and academic performance unless you have very low class sizes. So here are a couple of ideas in terms of trying to reestablish our priorities. We, are, we know from the research that we are able to identify in the late elementary and middle school years uh, the very likelihood, the large likelihood of which students are going to drop out and yet we have no sort of intervention strategies. We have these very high dropout rates of 25%. If we were to have smaller class sizes for kids who are at risk of dropping out, um, having counselors, having social workers for those students, um, I think that that uh, would be um, a worthwhile investment. I would also love to see, when we talk about the remediation issue for students that are going on to college, to have a writing class that every uh, student in high school would take that would not have a class size of more than 15. It would mean larger class sizes for other classes, but one writing class where students actually had their writing reviewed by someone and had an opportunity for kind of a give and take that, that 
is, is essential if you're going to become a good writer is something we ought to consider. We have a program here in California called um, Early uh, Assessment Program uh, that is instituted in the 11th grade for it's basically a California State University system uh, where we try to identify students who are likely to be remedial students when they enter um, uh, the CSU system as freshmen and when they are shown by this assessment system to be not on target to um, uh, avoiding remediation, uh, we are beginning to work to have in place senior English classes that will correct that. Uh, that program is, I think, proving to be very successful and we ought to have that program for UC students and for community college students as well. So the senior year, which uh, uh, so many people believe is a kind of a wasted year for students is a much more targeted year uh, so that we can begin to address some of these remediation um, issues. Last point to make is technology. Um, I don't know a lot about technology, but I've got to believe that technology can help in terms not only of possibly some potential savings, but also this whole issue of student engagement. Our biggest problem in our secondary schools is students are turned off, they are not engaged in their learning, and it seems to me this uh, technology revolution that we've had that students uh, are so um, enamored of and spend so much time on, there's got to be a way of capturing that kind of, um, of learning uh, in our um, particularly in our secondary system. So these are just some ideas that I think in addition to trying to get more money in the system to try to change the system somewhat and I think if we were to sort of link these uh, these things uh, that uh, it might be a way that we can sell this to the public. The last uh, sort of hopeful comment that I would make um, is when I was first in the legislature back in the mid-1970s ancient history half of the voters in California had children in our public education system. Today that's down to somewhere I think between 20 and 25 percent. We have half as many uh, voters who have kids in school and there was a prediction 30 years ago with this demographic trend that um, voter support for public education would decline substantially. And that really hasn't happened. Uh, as these public uh, uh, PPIC polls are indicating, uh, more taxes for education. Um, K-12 education is the last thing that people want to see cut. There is a strong sense that people believe and they know that education is really extremely important in terms of the American dream, equal educational opportunity, in terms of prosperity of our society, and that somehow what we have to do is to we don't have to necessarily, I think, um, educate the, the electorate that this is important. They understand that it's important. What we have to be able to do is to show to them a way by which we can increase these resources and how we can improve the system at the same time. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm glad you've brought up innovation because uh, I've been, my latest grind has been how hard this is going to be to get innovation in technology in the schools, given that our illustrious new governor, who I voted for both times he ran, uh, now at 74 years of age said he couldn't imagine what all those people were doing with cell phones, so he's going to take them all away. And I've been watching the news, you know, and I've been watching the internet, and I've been watching it again and again. And so about, uh, what is it, 60% of the government employees, state employees have cell phones, and he wants to get that down to about 15%. And, um, but there's been no analysis of how, ex how, how expensive it is to keep the landlines in. If you ever bought a telephone switch, you know how much it is, sending them to their desks. They have to be at their desks. The more, more features you have, all the, how expensive it is, there's been no cost analysis of that. I would be more excited if you said, let's see if we can't give everybody a cell phone <laughs> and get them, <laughs> retire all the rest of this stuff. So there is a huge thing in the educational system about having to, your, your experience of, of detailing, for me, uh, Gary, uh, all of the various things you might tweak and change, whatever. Let's not forget we have a last millennium system and uh, in engineering, that means build a new one. You have to transition there, but you've got to build a new one. And that may make a huge difference in, uh, in the accounting end. 
Uh, next, let's have Dr. Kim Rubin. She's a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. She's the director of the state and local program of the, uh, of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Um, her, in addition to other accomplishments, her master's is in, in economics from the London School of Economics, and her PhD is in economics from MIT. So welcome, Dr. Rubin. Hi, and I'm, you know, very excited that you're all still here. And I'm going to make some comments about education. And as you can probably tell from my biography, I am a budget person. So for my last five or six minutes, I'll probably go beyond education and talk a little bit more about California's budget and what we can and cannot expect. I might say things that I think are probably not politically feasible, but they'll be different things than what Norton covered. Um, so I actually think, not to say that education hasn't been cut or is not being cut in this budget, but if you look at the proposal, I think it actually does seem like it was cut less than a lot of other programs, at least on paper. Um, that's not to take away from the fact that there's been a 13% decline <laughs> over the last few years and the fact that there have been real cuts and changes in what's going forward with K-12. Um, I think there have been some good things. I like the fact that uh, Governor Schwarzenegger actually co consolidated a lot of the categorical programs. I think that gives districts some flexibility, and I think a lot of the points that have already been made uh, by Gary and Norton are right on, that basically giving districts more flexibility and letting them actually have more control over how they think they can most efficiently spend money is really a positive outcome, and I think the state should do more, especially as it's getting more money in, to think strategically about how it wants to refill education spending as it goes back up. So rather than just saying, okay, we're going to put this money back in all sorts of ways, we're going to reestablish these categorical programs, I think first, for the short run, we should have more strategic thoughts about what should be in that flex item. I'm not really sure why adult education should be part of a flex item that's mainly about school district funding. Um, I'm not really sure why class size reduction for ninth grade goes into the flex item, but K-3 to class size reduction doesn't. I think, so there could be some strategic thinking in the short run about what should be going on with that money. Then I actually think that you know Prop 98 might not be much of a guarantee in the um, bad budget times, but when budgets are expanding, especially as the economy recovers, it means K-12 gets a certain amount of money, or a K-14 gets money, and as that money comes back, I think it's critical for us to think about what our priorities are. Are we just going to give it out to all the states in terms of the revenue limit money? Are we going to do something with categorical money? Or should we think about whether that money should be earmarked to try and improve educational attainment, say, for the low-income students. I, I was also going to bring up the whole weighted stu student formula uh, and think about the fact that we probably want to be more strategic. I think we need to think as a state about what our outcomes should be, what, what it is we're trying to achieve. And I think what we're trying to achieve and what we should be trying to achieve is improve student achievement, not just increasing the amount of money that goes to schools. Um, both of the people who talked before me talked about how we've dropped in our relative ranking of spending for schools. I was going to bring up a different number, which is we've basically doubled the amount we're spending per pupil since 1996. Um, and we haven't seen any change in the NAEP scores over that period. Now, granted, some of that might have to do with the fact that we have a changing student population. But I kind of think rather than just say, OK, we need to spend more money on schools, I think we need to think about how we spend money strategically. The beginning of that has to be, how do we uh, pay teachers? When we're talking about education spending, and when we're talking about a lot of what state and local governments do, we're talking about compensating people. And so I think we actually have to think hard about how it is that we have our salary structure set up. In K-12 education, does it make sense for us to have the step column system that doesn't seem to have anything to do with quality in the classroom? Um, I think there's some evidence that you get some return to sort of about four or five years of education, but I don't see a lot of return overall for more experience. 
There's little evidence, if any evidence, that more education actually leads to better student achievement. And so it's not clear why this is how we're rewarding teachers. It's also not clear why we have very backloaded pension programs. It might be that you want to encourage people to stay, but it also might be that there are certain teachers who aren't really that effective, and we don't necessarily want to give them incentives to stay in teaching rather than go off and do something else if they might be more effective doing that. So I propose that California, like some of the other states, um, Wisconsin has just proposed having some sort of merit pay. I think California should try and get different ways of evaluating who are the most effective teachers, who are less effective teachers, and maybe reward them for that. Something that could happen that was uh, proposed by a couple of researchers, Marguerite Rosa has proposed this, what if you actually can evaluate which teachers are most effective and give them, more, give them the option of earning more salary, but say that they actually have to teach more students. So we're gonna expand classes for the most effective teachers which will mean that you could actually expose more children to the people who we think are doing the best job. Some of this can be based on value-added measures from test scores, but I think we want to go beyond that, right? There have been all sorts of studies and um, evaluations in place that show that there are different ways that people know who are effective teachers. If you interview principals, if you interview students, the, the Gates Foundation just actually came up has a new program underway where they've actually shown that if you talk to students about what's going on in their classroom, you actually have pretty good evidence about which students and which are doing well and how they're going to do on exams based on whether they think they're engaged and learning within the classroom. So if we can do something with how we um, reward teachers, I also think we probably want to do something where we move to paying for teachers at the school level rather than at the district level. Right now, within big districts, you have negative incentives for how st teachers are appointed to schools based on seniority. So you can actually have all your experienced teachers not in the schools that actually have the most at-risk students because if you price a teacher at an average price, then the teachers don't have incentives to stay in different schools. So Partly, I think what we want to do is focus on what it is we're trying to achieve in education. <laughs> and from my perspective, I would like to see more resources, not necessarily dollars, but resources focused on high poverty, low achieving students if we want to try and bring them up. My little, do I have a couple minutes? So my little aside about the state budget in general. So the part of it that's very sad is we've sat here and heard people talk about the four biggest programs in the state budget, and everybody thinks we need more money in all of them, which might be true. Um, I wasn't going to show pictures. I don't know if you can see this. This is a picture of the structural deficits in California for the last, oh, 15 years. So even before we hit the budget, the economic downturn, California was running structural deficits. In some ways, it's not the case that we're only cutting things now. We've been overspending the amount of revenue we've been bringing in as a state. And I think there needs to be some hard lessons about how much money we should be raising in taxes and how we want to spend that money. And part of that is going to have to be thinking about things like how do we compensate our public sector? What are we doing with pensions and other retirement benefits? and making some hard decisions. And some of this might be you know, providing more tough love to voters about the fact that you can't have three strike laws and class size reduction and Prop 13 and Prop 98 and not raise taxes and still have the level of spending that they want. You know, The PPIC polls, every time they come out, I always find it very disheartening because we always get the same message. Voters don't want to cut spending don't want to cut spending, but they don't want to raise taxes. And the taxes that they're willing to raise are things like business taxes, which only raise 9% of general fund revenue. So business taxes cannot be the answer. And in some ways, it's trying to square this circle and get things more on track, I think, is going to be the hard lesson. Now, it's what we're talking about isn't sustainable. Right now, we're spending about 14 to 15% of personal income on state and local 
uh, programs, which is about our historical level. If healthcare costs keep going up, and we want to spend more on schools, and we want to spend more on higher education, it just doesn't work. At some point, something has to give. And I think what's going to need to happen is there's going to need to be a reshuffling of what we're going to do as a state in California. And I'll stop. You know, in listening to this, um, there's a couple things. One is that um, I hate it when everyone takes out adult education. I know we're K through 12. We've talked about higher education, but I want to talk about adult education just for a second, just to remember that we're living longer and longer thanks to biotech and everything else. If we happen to get that health care, we're going to, most many of us will be living much longer than we ever imagined. Um, and the idea that we'll be changing jobs, not just because of other economic factors, but that we're seeing people come back later and later to adult education and they change. And the final thing that I'm hearing, and I, I want us to remember, uh, is the magic of education. I mean, I'm an engineer and a scientist, so you know, we like to measure things where we can. We like to have all of that. And But if you came over to my house for a spaghetti dinner and we had a great time and the spaghetti was great, you can't go back in and measure every little thing about how that all came out to a great spaghetti dinner that we always remember for the rest of our lives, which included being together and there. And I'll give you an example from... Uh, from uh, just uh, Wednesday night, I was teaching, I teach a class, one of the classes I teach in the graduate level is global information systems. And I had, uh, uh, in one of the assignments, they had to go out and find, ask some questions, find some global data. And part of the thing is to put your presentation up and put a world map up of what you found across, you just they're uh, pushing them constantly to what's the information out there. And a young man stood up and um, he said, uh, uh, well, I, I, in my life, I've lost four friends to suicide, I've lost three friends to accidents, and I've lost three friends to cancer. And I really thought that there was something wrong with me. And then I looked at the male mortality figures, and he flashed them up on the screen. And he said, and this is what it's like for males in the United States, and this is like for males around the world. And I looked and he said, you know, I found a lot of solace in that. I found a lot of comfort. And <laughs> we were just like, oh, sometimes you got classes like this. We need to move along to the next person. And um, unbelievably, one of the students in there came to me afterwards, wrote me a very, uh, even though I talked to her in strident letter afterwards, and she said, he did not include a world map, and you're being harsher on, and I was like, I'm supposed to tell this guy, he didn't have a world map, and I said, look it, he's gonna get marked down because the assignment said you gotta do A, B, C, D, he didn't do D and E. This was a success. This is what we were talking about. And the magic of a student, or a set of students in a classroom with a teacher can't be measured in a lot of the ways we're measuring them now. So I do want to be cautious about looking at our systems and looking at them perhaps a different way for what we want to fund, how we fund it, how we measure it, and, and just measuring teachers and may not exactly be the right formulation for the right district and, and the right situation everybody's in. Now our final speaker today is uh, Tom Tamar. He's a professor uh, of education policy and director of the Center for Applied Policy and Education at UC Davis. He's currently working on a study tracking local responses to state deregulation of 40 categorical programs in education. Thank you, Phew. Uh, I'm gonna try not to sound like an echo in here <laughs> after what everybody else has said about education. And uh, I'm gonna uh, do my best to try to say something different. Although certainly what uh, uh, the other speakers have said, uh, Kim and Gary and Norton, uh, very much echo my own sentiments and very much uh, what I was going to say and what I, um, the comments that I wanted to make, but let me see if I can add something to this uh, that is maybe uh, bring some uh, new information to it or maybe a different perspective. Uh, one, of course, I, I want to talk just a bit about where we are. Um, on, now, you know, we're 
we're facing this uh, $26.7 billion budget deficit. And obviously, the first thing that the state has to do is, is to dig itself out of that. Because until it does, uh, it's very difficult to move ahead and to consider any kind of new initiatives. Uh, and as others have pointed out, um, much of this deficit, uh, at least $21 uh, billion of it, is responsible, uh, is the result of uh, prior failed legislative solutions. And that is of people having kicked the can down the road all these years. And that these basic, as Kim said, there are these fundamental structural problems uh, in, in the state revenue system uh, that they have sort of band-aided over the years. And so, uh, and they really began after Prop 13 in, 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 in K-12 education. They were compounded. Uh, with uh, the Serrano decision and uh, equalization provisions and limits on school districts in terms of uh, their own uh, ability to generate revenues. And so it's, it's a problem that has really been growing and growing and growing, and now it's finally sort of come to, to the point where it, it just can't be covered up anymore. Now, on the one hand, you know, you could say that $26 uh, billion is a lot of money, and for most of us it is. On the other hand, if you think about the state and the state uh, domestic product of being $1.9 trillion, uh, $25 billion is not a huge, at least I don't think it's a huge amount of money. You may disagree with this, but really it's only 1.4% of the state domestic product, and you would think that 1.4% is not a disaster. I mean, it's certainly well within the means. It's well within the capability of this state to cover that kind of deficit. Uh, which, of course, you know, raises the next question that you know, what we're spending on education right now, on K-12 education now, which is down under $40 billion, it's not a very a substantial part of the gross state product, certainly not compared to other countries. I mean, we like to talk about California as being one of the eighth largest economies in the world. But if you look at those other large economies and what their gross domestic share of uh, education spending is of their gross domestic product, it's much closer to 5%. Um, and, so, and so the question is whether we're really underinvested. Now, people have made, I've talked about, and, and, and it certainly is true, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, that, um, the, uh, that California is not necessarily undertaxed. I mean, California has a very progressive uh, taxing system. California, uh, Californians are taxed above the national average in all areas except property taxes. And property taxes, California, is about 14% uh, below the national average. Um, so what, what does the governor's proposal do? I won't dwell on this much because people have already talked about it. Obviously, there are reductions. There's about, over the last two, three years, th uh, three years, there's been about $800 per pupil reduction. Um, and so the challenge, of course, is for the state to be able to uh, 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 maintain at least the current levels, although current levels are uh, pretty depressing, uh, but to maintain those. Um, and of course, that you know depends upon whether or not the state uh, is going to, or whether the the tax extensions are going to be approved. Now, the tax extensions uh, mean that two thirds of the legislature has to approve them, and then a majority of the voters have to approve them. Now, whether that chain of events, how likely that chain of events is, uh, is anybody's guess. Uh, whether, whether people understand the severity of the problem uh, is, who knows. Uh, if, the ta if the tax extension doesn't pass, we will reduce uh, on average per pupil expenditures by another $330. So again, we're really headed, headed downhill, um, even at a greater rate than before if that uh, is, to, uh, is, is to happen. Um, there are other problems with the uh, governor's current uh, proposal, uh, which uh, people have alluded to. Uh, one, of course, has to do with the deferrals. Uh, California started this business of, 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 of deferrals. And the reason these deferrals became popular because it was a way of, of well, it, it was smoke and mirrors. 
Uh, and so what you could do is you could move money into the next year and pretend you didn't, pat, didn't spend it this year, that wasn't this year's money. Uh, we started back, I think it was in 2001 when we did the first deferrals, and it was a small amount of money, just a few million here and there, 10 million or something. And now we're up to, um, you know, to something like uh, $9 billion in deferrals. Now, uh, for school districts, that's real money. Because, for example, Stockton, it means they're going to have to go out into the open market and they're going to have to borrow money to get through this because most districts have spent their reserves down. They can't tap into their reserves as a way of uh, uh, backfilling for these uh, lost revenues, uh, deferred revenues. And so they're going to have to come back and they're going to have to go borrow money. Stockton, for example, estimates going to cost them an additional $250,000 uh, in borrowing to be able to pay that off. Well, you know, you multiply those numbers across 987 school districts in the state and it's, it's real money. Um, so, so there are, there are problems. Um, so uh, other proposals from the governor. Um, uh, I, everyone here has talked about the categorical programs in California. Uh, when I first uh, got to know Gary, I, I went, when I finished my PhD here at Berkeley, uh, I went up to work for the legislature, and my job was to be a consultant to a joint Senate Assembly committee that was conducting oversight of uh, categorical programs in education. At that time, there were something like 17 or 18 categorical programs uh, that amounted to about 14% uh, of education spending. In, in 2001, 2002, uh, there were, by last count, depending on how you count it, 100, over 120 categorical programs uh, representing about 34 to 35% of K-12 education spending, which meant that there was an encroachment on the unrestricted dollars and there, there was less money in the unrestricted share of money going out to districts and a greater share of restricted money. Now, um, the question with these categoricals, of course, is uh, did they, what was the purpose of these categorical dollars? Uh, the Serrano uh, court, um, basically um, uh, exempted uh, categoricals, obviously, from, from equalization because categorical monies were intended to meet special needs and special purposes for districts. So they were targeted to students with special needs like special education, districts that had huge you know, transportation, extraordinary transportation costs and things like that. And so they were exempted. But soon it looked as though these categorical dollars were being used by districts as an end run around Serrano. And so the, the legislature could provide monies to some districts and um, uh, the educational benefits of some of these programs were never evaluated. So no one really knew what the impact of these categoricals was or what the educational benefit of these categorical programs were. And so, uh, so these just sort of grew and grew and proliferated. Well, uh, as, as others have said, the, uh, uh, the, the legislature decided uh, in 2008-2009 uh, uh, budget, that they did this in February, to uh, essentially consolidate 40 categoricals that amounted to about $4.5 billion uh, in state spending. And the idea was to give flexibility to school districts. So school districts could take the carryover funds from these from previous years, and they could take uh, the current money and just put them all in a pot and treat them as unrestricted revenues, as block grant revenues, and um, spend them any way they liked. Although the legislation said that schools still had to adhere to the general purposes of those categorical programs. That was taken from the original sunset language in 1979 or 80, whenever that was. But, and so it was quite confusing as to exactly what that, what that meant. But nonetheless, so, um, but the concern had been with categorical funding is that if the money did not, it was not uh, specified, if the, if the money wasn't regulated, school districts wouldn't use it for the purposes for which they were intended. So that money would not flow to students who had um, 
uh, to English language learners. The money wouldn't flow to students who had uh, uh, learning disabilities and so on. Um, and so, so that was one. Now, the, um, what the governor has proposed is to extend that and to extend the, is to extend the, um, uh, a to, in, to add more categorical programs to those uh, exemptions, to so what's called this tier three exemption. And um, the, uh, 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 on Monday, there was a hearing uh, on the uh, Assembly Budget Committee uh, where actually the, um, some of the members there uh, wanted to actually remove some of the programs from the current tier three uh, deregulation. And of all, you know, all the discussions I've had with the leadership in the legislature so far has been that when that sunset date for these categoricals comes, they are going back. They are going to be re-regulated. We don't care what the people in the field think. Well, the people in the field think that these are actually, uh, this was a very good idea because it provided them uh, with much needed flexibility. And the study that we're doing shows that districts did, you know, I mean, the money was used to backfill, uh, at, to maintain fiscal solvency in districts, to be able to keep, uh, to, to, to um, not have to lay off teachers and so on. And, and districts did not ignore student needs. They may have reconfigured adult education, but often what they would do is that they would go and sort of prioritize what the needs were in adult education. Yes, they got rid of some of the leisure classes and so on, but they certainly maintained their focus on uh, classes for Engli English as a second language classes and so on. And so districts really did do uh, a, a good job in trying to, uh, uh, within the framework and within this sort of very difficult budget, uh, of trying to, um, uh, trying to spend monies in a way uh, that, uh, that um, you know, really did meet student needs and try to maintain programs. Now, of course, as other people pointed out, a lot of programs were eliminated. I mean, arts and music, uh, gifted and talented, and so on. A lot of programs, which I'll get to in a moment a little bit, uh, some other comments about that, but, but a lot of these programs have been eliminated. And so there's kind of this winnowing down of you know, what the school curriculum is to a focus on math, uh, and, 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 and reading uh, because those are the, uh, um, because that's what's tested. Um, okay, so in the long term, uh, what are the proposals? Well, um, I, one is, I, I think my, first of all, I would say that we have to rethink the entire uh, tax and revenue code. Uh, you know, we don't, as the, uh, uh, the commission that, um, uh, Assembly Speaker Bass appointed several years ago uh, found is that, you know, they, our current tax uh, and revenue code, our, our, yes, tax and revenue code was basically developed in the, was written in the 1930s, and there really hasn't been much revision of that. Well, at that time, California was, was a very different, had a very different kind of economy, and what counted for economic activity, or what, what was economic activity, was very different than it is now. I mean, it was much more heavily manufacturing and so on, and now it shifted much toward, more toward service and sales tax. Well, we don't capture a lot of that. In fact, we capture very little of it. Um, I don't know, in 1980, I remember the tax on beer hadn't changed since in California since 1935 or 1936. And again, I, I agree with the speaker this morning uh, that we need to start taxing beer and wine and drinks. And a 25, just a 25 cent tax on a drink would bring in about $3 billion a year. And it's not, it's not an excessive amount of money, you know, per drink. And, uh, again, it might have the benefits of even reducing alcoholism and so on. So, you know, there, there are the other huge problem that California has is that 47% um, that uh, of our of general fund revenues come from 1% of the population. And no wonder you have a volatile system of taxation. I mean, when you depend on such a tiny group of people and their behavior and their well-being to generate a large amount of money, 
you're bound to have volatility in the system, and that's exactly what we have. So what we need to do is we need to go to a much broader kind of uh, system of taxation uh, that spreads the costs, and we can't keep going to the well of saying, you know, let's go to the top, uh, you know, top, the wealthiest people in the state, the top one uh, percent uh, of wealthiest people are those people who earn over a hundred thousand uh, dollars a year. Uh, and as I said, personal income taxes generate four point nine seven billion dollars of. Um, uh, uh, of general fund revenues and taxpayers with incomes more than $100,000 paid 84% of this tax in 2008. So um, uh, as time is running out, I'll stop here. But, but again, I think just leave you with that, 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 uh, that we need to change the, the system of taxation. And of course, as others have said too, I won't repeat what everybody else has said about changing also how uh, we fund schools. I mean, it's, it's as, as the getting down the facts study uh, argued, it is completely dysfunctional and it doesn't make any sense. It is irrational. Uh, our uh, school funding system is based on the 1972-73 uh, uh, re revenue limits that were established and it's been sort of built on, band-aided ever since then. Uh, tinkered with since then, but it is completely disconnected from the true cost of providing education in any given district in the state. So it's completely irrational. It is inequitable. Uh, categorical programs uh, are inequitably allocated. So anyway, it, it just we need we need a massive uh, uh, change in the way that we're we're funding schools and the way we think about them and especially to be able to address the kinds of issues that both Gary and Norton talked about uh, in terms of really targeting more toward educational objectives and how can we focus money more on the kinds of out educational outcomes that we want. So I'm going I'm to stop there. Thank you. Maybe we shouldn't tax, tax K through 12 teachers and make sure they're salaries are tied to 15% over the sanitation workers. And that might make it a really nice place. I'm going to ask one question here, and then we'll go to the audience. Um, if you were going to radically go in and change any area, whether it's insert innovation, just go back, you get, for some reason, they were going to let you do it, redesign some area of K through 12 education, what would it be? Let me ask each one. Norton, let's start there. Uh, that's not education. Get in there to the education system. What would you change in the education system? Well, I'd improve teacher training and principal training. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, the, tr the training of, uh, of teachers, um, but I wouldn't call it merit pay. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, what, uh, what was said by Kim, but I think that's not the, the way to frame it. I think it's a career ladder. It's a different way of evaluating teachers. Uh, it's paying teachers differently based upon what they do, um, but I think that's the most important thing we ought to consider. Kim? Yeah, I would go with sort of rethinking compensation and what the incentives are and how we evaluate. But it would also be sort of, actually, I would probably want to sort of get more money down to the actual school-based budgeting stuff down to the students so that we're actually pricing things at their actual costs. Yeah at the level that actually affects the student. Yeah, Every, it, all schools are not the same. It's all not a machine. Are not the same. Exactly. Tom. Well, take a little bit different tack. I, I think uh, we, we need to change our accountability system. I, I think it's just it's this kind of run amok thing we've got right now where we're just awash in numbers. Nobody knows what they mean. They have consequences for people, uh, but, but, uh, but, but, but no real substance. Um, uh, I, I believe in accountability. I think we need an accountability system, but I think the one we have uh, actually hurts poor children. I think it hurts disadvantaged children. Just to quickly say, you know, in the 1879 Constitutional Convention, there's this fabulous debate about education and the purpose of education and whether the state ought to provide a sort of this expanded version of education or a narrow form of education, reading, writing, arithmetic. 
And one of the delegates said, if we only provide reading, writing, and arithmetic, that's what the poor people are going to get. And what the rich people are going to get is the good education that they can afford to pay for privately. And unfortunately, that's the direction we're headed. You know, we're headed towards schools that, are low, that serve low-income students. And they spent a Vallejo, I heard, you know, had students in high school take three classes of, of language arts and two classes of math. That's it. And it's all remedial. And so that's what they get. If you go to Piedmont, if you go to you know, Palo Alto High School, you get a very, very different kind of education. They've got 14 different advanced you placement You have a private classes. school education. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, for me, I, that would be a huge priority. That would be great. Let's go to the audience here. Yes, sir, over there. So I want to revisit the question of business taxation. It's true if we think of business taxation in terms of taxes on corporate gross receipts for incomes, there's a limit. But let's look at the people who are now collecting very large rents in the economic sense in California. There are incumbent telephone companies. There are cable monopolists. There are owners of billboard space. There are owners of legacy water rights. All of those things could be taxed without any impact on economic efficiencies because those assets cannot run away. And we're talking about tens of billions of dollars. Ten There's more no seconds to complete your comment or ask a question. So the, the, the completion of the comment is yeah. the claim that we can't raise a lot of money without increasing the personal income tax is just false. We have to go at rent owners, and we can. Great. Another question out here. There. Uh, hi, um, Giovanni Ree, UC Berkeley electrical engineering graduate. Um, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Tom Tumar for his comment about uh, 25 cent tax on alcohol. I think that's the greatest suggestion I've ever heard. Uh, it's going to be uh, drink one for the kids, and we'll have uh, <laughs> college uh, drinking songs about Tim Tamar's suggestion, and that's it's just fantastic. And uh, <laughs> secondly, I, there is a flaw in the agenda, and I propose this is United States of America. It's a democracy. We should vote on this. Um, the missing piece on this agenda is that we don't have uh, like uh, we've had each individual panel have some Q&A, but we haven't had, we, there's no spot for Q&A for the whole entire uh, day. And I think that in the, should take the 4.45 to 5 o'clock, uh, 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A for the entire day. And so I propose, you know, that we have a vote here right now. Uh, who would like to do this to take 15 minutes for a Q&A right after this? It's right in the post-conference time. Take 15 minutes for what? We, we don't have his, we don't have his tax proposal passed yet. No, 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 no comments for the panel. This is the audience here. Who says we take 15 minutes for an entire day Q&A? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, opposed? Opposed? Abstaining? Okay, I'm afraid the resolution uh, failed. I'm very sorry. But I'll buy you a drink at 445. That makes you feel bad. Can I just say that, you know, Allegheny County in Pennsylvania passed a drinks tax, and they had the biggest revolts of people who were just so incensed by the fact that their prices A drunken beer mob. Went up. <laughs> like, they wrote songs about it. And it was like this big furor, and they basically recalled their county supervisors because, you know, that quarter a drink pissed them off. Now, that may have been Pittsburgh, <laughs> and California might be different, Berkeley but... Different. That's right. Be yeah. uh, Sir, in the back there. CMU Where's, there in Pittsburgh. Where is the... Okay, Bob? It's Bob. Yeah. Uh, I, this is question is mainly for uh, Senator Hart, but maybe... Uh, related points for a couple of others. For, I'm intrigued by the question about differential salaries, uh, you know, based on subject matter. I gathered this, uh, you know, designed to get more techies in. First, uh, the other states do this. Second, would you do it even for elementary school where you don't have subject differentiation, but you're just trying to kind of enrich the teacher population generally uh, with more science people? Let me just get in a really unrelated question for anybody. Uh, on the question of you know comparing uh, prison guard salaries to teacher salaries, uh, the teachers unions is pretty rich and pretty strong. Uh, the prison guards union is maybe richer and stronger. Uh, is the difference that 
Uh, independent of money, politicians are more afraid of the prison guards union because of their ability to control simple messaging, you know, on the rather demagogic issue of crime. Whereas teaching, you know, no matter how much money teachers have, a teacher's union have, the message simply doesn't provoke or frighten legislators very much. Gary. Um, I don't know. I mean, part of it is this categorical issue because a third or a fourth of the money is tied up in categorical um, funds. And I must say, I was one of the perpetrators of that because uh, one thing I didn't cover is that California is number one in teacher salaries. Even though compared to prison guards, we're $20,000 less, we pay teachers better in California than any other states. But in terms of student um, contacts with professionals on counselors, on teachers, on administrators, on librarians, we are 50th uh, or, or very close, 47, 48, 49. So to keep some of the, if you give the money to school districts, uh, it will be on the collective bargaining table, it will uh, almost entirely go for salaries. But if you carve out a portion of that money, which we have done in previous, previous years, uh, to ensure that some of those monies uh, uh, are, are reflected in, you know, instructional hours with students. Uh, that that may explain it. But I, I I also think that there's something that the state, uh, if the state controls a particular, uh, you know, program, uh, it, you know, it, it's clear what what the consequences are of that. If we give the money to the local school districts and how they spend it, that's sort of another matter. And as a result, uh, there's some disengagement, I think, by the state as it relates to education expenditures because we don't have that direct control. Next question. You're, you're not drinking for another 11 minutes, so don't, don't. Could, could I just, could I, could I add something Please here? do, Tom. I, I, mean, I mean, Gary points a really important problem, and, and it's one that, I mean, and I understand that debate about categoricals, and, 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 in, it, it explains in part why they grew as much as they did, but certainly not entirely. Um, you know, and it's one of those problems with democracy. I mean, in the uh, community where I live, uh, I, I just watched them spend 13 million, or no, more than that, 14 or 15 million dollars on renovating a new high school football stadium. And I thought, what? You know, why not, I mean, did it ever occur to anybody to spend that kind of money on science labs? Or, you know, to do something really innovative in technology, but on a football stadium? I mean, is, you know, I mean, is that what this, this is all about? Is that, you know, that's why we have the high school? And so there are these decisions that just make your head spin, and you wonder, you know, what are these people thinking? And do they even know what kind of an education their children need? But, you know, that's well, democracy. People voted yeah. on that. They voted on this bond, and they indebted themselves for the next 20, and me too, by the way, uh, you know, for the next 20 years to pay this thing off. Well, hey, three days in Iraq is the annual budget of NASA, so I don't know where we're going <laughs> next time. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Patrick Howard of Coral Fellow Public Affairs. To, uh, to what degree do you see the institutional complexity of California's education system? And I'm here, I'm thinking, like, there's the state superintendent of public instruction, there's the state board of education, there's the state department of education, there's the legislature, there's like the initiatives like Prop 98 and Prop 49, just kind of that complexity precluding this, these sort of thoughtful policy responses to California's education problems. Hmm. I think it's a big issue and it's one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I think Proposition 98 is a mistake because it's <coughs> It just made it that much more difficult for people to understand. <clears throat> and as a result, in Sacramento, the debate on school finance is, how do we make the minimum on Proposition 98, or how do we get around it, rather than a serious discussion about what is an appropriate level of funding for the future of, you know, of California as it relates to education. So, um, and of course, it's not only 98. Uh, there are all these other categoricals that are part of the problem and uh, a series of sort of uh, encrusted systems that go all the way back to court decisions with Serrano and preceding Serrano. So I think it's a good point. Uh, a question over here. Over here. Uh, uh, right here. Right here. Um, uh, thank you for all your fantastic suggestions and ideas and all the previous panels too. I think uh, taking off from what Steve Weiner was saying, if there's a silver lining, there's all these great ideas and you think about if the Egyptian people could get rid of Hosni Mubarak, surely we could 
get things right here in California. We don't have to get rid of a dictator. Uh, massive, massive demonstration. We can start right here today. <laughs> but I just wanted to ask you, uh, there is a strategic issue, uh, and some of you may not have noticed, but like the, the legislative analysts last week, they, they are calling for immediately getting rid of all these categorical programs. Jerry Brown has said you know, he wants to extend the ones we have now for the next two years, and the LAO is more or less saying, you know, we should just start now. But there is this issue on the table. Is it possible, really, to move on any of these reforms, particularly around the school finance issues, when we got this big budget crisis? I think it's especially when it might actually happen. Right. It the, the fact that there's pressure means that the state is giving some discretion to the districts. The question is whether we need to rethink about what it is we're doing. The, the problem with California's budget and education and all these other things is if you add up the different components, it's not clear it can keep going. Like if healthcare costs keep expanding, which drives up the general fund because Medi-Cal is going up, but that drives up Prop 98 because then they get 40% of the general fund budget. It, how does this ever end? And it seems like right now there are hard choices that need to be made, but it might be the only time when we can actually think outside the box. In, in stuff like public sector you know, compensation, the fact that people are coming to the table and actually speaking honestly about what pensions might look like and what those liabilities are for the first time. While it's scary, it might be encouraging that we might be able to make progress. One more question before the end. This lady here. Oh, there's one. I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, I, <clears throat> I've got uh, three public school teachers in my family here in California, and they've been in uh, the system for collectively 30 years, about 10 years apiece two down in Bakersfield, one in the Delta, their ideologies spread from far right to far left. They complain about two things. One thing they don't complain about is their, their income. Uh, they don't seem to be too upset about their income. But what they do complain about, which is very interesting to me, top on their list, is returning to a system where all these special ed categorical category functions are separated out. Now, I know that flies in the face of all kinds of California notions, but that's what they complain about. What I'm saying is that they would like to see special ed for specialist students be separated out of the school. They'd like to see uh, they, they like to see uh, English as a second language separated out of the school. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm telling you, but that's on their minds, which is amazing. Both when they're sober and they're not sober, they say the same thing. Uh, the second thing that they talk about is uh, seeing, uh, they really do, this concept of, of class size for these people is critical. Uh, the notion that, that they're going to teach sixth graders uh, in the same way that Cal teaches, you know, Econ 115 is ludicrous in their minds. Uh, and the burden to them, they can't be paid enough to teach these people well. Yeah, they'll take the, uh, the extra income because they do live for their pensions. Great. All right. Thank you. Let's just have one last quick question here, quick an question and answers. Yes. Um, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I've been reading this week about the, you know, this possible special election uh, for the extension, and I'm a little disturbed about uh, hearing on one side uh, saying, no, we don't want to scare people by telling them what might be cut. We just want them to extend it. And then the other side will say, well, yes, we should scare them. And I see a long time League of Women Voters <laughs> person um, that the voters in California have themselves to blame because they've put all this money into different pots. Uh, you know, Prop 98, Prop whatever, you know, all of them that I've seen all these years. Do you think, um, personally, I think the people should be scared by what might be cut if they don't pass, you know, extensions and whatever. So just your comments on that. Scared? 
Well, I, th I think it's a travesty in government to hide information from voters. So the notion you would not tell voters what would likely to be happen is just tr totally dreadful, um, just on small d democratic principles. And then, you know, I think people need to face what might happen. Um, so I'm all in favor of, so to speak, scaring the voters, but I don't like to put it that way. It's informing the voters so that they can make reasonable decisions. Now I'm going to take this and say, here's your, here's your final word. I'm going to start with you, Norton. Um, uh, one of the final words I want to make is, we've been talking a lot about money. Um, and uh, I, you know, I was uh, quite surprised and pleased to see that most of us here agreed that we shouldn't be talking about money as much as resources. But there is one issue on the t uh, that we have forgotten about, and that is um, the planning that districts and schools have to go through uh, when they're in a period of real uncertainty. Normally, schools start planning for the next year in about um, March, um, next month. But of course, they're not going to know how much money they're going to have until well after the June election. So the, the kind of planning that schools and districts can do for next year, you know, they can't plan. And so you have year after year after year, you have schools kind of rushing in August to try to put together groups of teachers and and you know programs and figure out what programs are being cut. So quite apart from the fact that California has been, in my view, completely irresponsible in the level of funding, it's been completely irresponsible in allowing, in, in coming, making decisions in such a way that schools can actually they, they plan. Have to do a year this ahead. happens yeah. year after year after year. Yeah, great. Gary Hart. Um, secondary schools have changed very little. Um, dress has changed, language has changed, that kids use in the hallway, but the actual instruction that occurs has hardly changed at all in 50 years. And we have to figure out a way, getting back to your comment about innovation, of to how can we restructure, remodel, you know, this system. Uh, and it involves many different things, and, uh, you know, we focused a little bit on, you know, teacher compensation and, and trying to, to reconfigure. I would just say, as someone, again, hoping not sounding too defensive, but categorical programs provide a means to try to get to take a look at some things a little bit differently. Um, because the system as it exists uh, is, is very resistant to change. Um, it's a cultural construct. Um, everyone has been through it, everybody is comfortable with it, and to change it um, requires some outside pressure or force in order to, to do so. Categoricals provide a way to provide um, some incentives for sometimes things to be done a little bit differently. The problem with the categoricals, there are too many, they last too long, um, but uh, I just want to offer a cautionary note that the system is a status quo bound <coughs> system and we've got to figure out some ways through sanctions and incentives to, to try to goose it and change it in some ways because it's not going to happen on its own, I don't believe. In addition to the technology and innovation, we're talking about a good 15 solid years of neuroscience in the last 15 years that tells us a lot more about how our brains work, how we learn, how we're motivated, how we're demotivated, and how we behave, and that all needs to get folded in. Kim. Well, I was going to go with technology and talk about how we could do more personalized learning, but since Gary did that, I'll talk about uh, early education and pre-K. We didn't really talk about it. We didn't talk about the fact that child care was cut. Um, we, we don't want something like universal pre-K because I think that just costs a lot of money and it's not really clear the state can afford it. But, you know, focusing on the fact that what you do when kids are really young gets them ready and helps build on these other things is critically important. And so those are programs and those pre-K programs, especially for low-income kids, probably need protection. And if we can actually move them forward, I think that helps a lot going onward in their education. Great, Tom. Good point. Well, I think I think much the same. I, you know, we need we need to rethink uh, what uh, yes, what happens at, at 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 the high school. I think we also need to do a much better job of trying to align uh, education through through the entire system of getting. I mean, the, I think one of the biggest challenges, as other people pointed out in the higher education panel, is making sure that we have uh, enough uh, degrees, that we produce enough degrees, particularly in math and science, I mean, or the, in the STEM, STEM areas. 
uh, we simply are, are, are lacking in the number of students who are, who are going into those areas, who are majoring in those areas. And, and, that's, and that's a critical area. So I think the state has to really target that and find ways of trying to uh, get students into that pipeline so that they, so that they will, uh, um, you know, will, will end up in, uh, with college degrees. Uh, it's, it's a huge challenge right now, given the demographics of the state and given what the um, you know, dropout is among the fastest growing demographic and what, what the uh, college completion rates are. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge, but I think California has to uh, own up to it at some point. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. Yeah. <laughs> That's where we had to go. The panel, Norton Grubb, Gary Hart, Kim Rubin, and Tom Timmer, thank you. <laughs> and now sit there, Rook, just one more minute, and, uh, and now Henry Brady. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank uh, Chris Ansel and Kathleen Madigan, who did fabulous work in making this happen. Uh, I want to thank the Travers family for supporting this year after year. I hope, and I think we really did, meet the high standard that Travers conferences have had over the year, uh, years. Uh, this has just been extraordinarily wonderful in terms of the insights I've gotten about the, and I thought I knew a lot about the state budget. I've learned a lot today. And so therefore, finally, I want to thank our panelists, many of whom are still in the audience, uh, for your great contributions, so thank you very much. <laughs>